Awesome. Okay. Um, so just a little bit about myself. I've been fencing since about, so first of all, I am Remy de la Matana de Gascon of the East Kingdom, uh, master of fence uh, in all the other fencing awards that we have out here in the East Kingdom. Uh, I also have our grant level award for ANS for my fencing research, which is pretty cool. I'm pretty excited about that. That just happened a little while ago. So I'm kind of glad that some research is paying off too. Uh, I've been fencing since like 2008 is when I started doing Olympic fencing, did foil for a couple of years, kind of decided, yep, this was cool and fun, but I wanted uh, something a little bit more realistic in quotation marks. And I stumbled across the SCA on YouTube of all places. I saw like some Penzik battles. I'm like, hey, that looks pretty cool. Wonder if they do stuff with rapier. That's how I found the SCA. So I've been fencing with the SCA since about 2010. And I started studying Italian rapier a couple of years after that. Uh, basically, I realized, uh, yes, I could win a bunch of bouts by being very skinny and very fast and short. Like I'm not a big, I wasn't a big target. I can move around a lot, uh, but you got to hit a plateau after a while. So I think I needed to figure out how these weapons actually worked. Uh, unfortunately, by the time I started studying, there was a whole bunch of great resources out there. Uh, so I've been doing primarily Italian rapier. Since then, uh, reading a bunch of different manuals, trying to learn from the masters and other people that have been studying this as well and, and everything like that. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about my background in terms of where I'm coming from, from a teaching and stuff. Um, so I guess we'll start off with a warm up for anyone that feels like they want to do the physical aspect of this. So this is a very generic warm up that I do with my uh, classes. Honestly, if there is uh, a warm up that works better for you, by all means, feel free to do that now. Um, there's going to be time a little bit at the end where you can kind of hit up specific muscle groups uh, that you know is just a little bit tighter for you. So if you have really like tight shoulders, you'll have extra time to hit shoulders beyond what we just do and stuff. Uh, but aside for just kind of look over our shoulders, just back and forth, getting the neck muscles and traps kind of loosened up. Go nice and easy. Start off with feeling kind of good. You can go a little bit further. Listen to what your body's telling you. One that's good about the warm-ups is that you really get an idea of how your body's feeling this particular day. Because uh, you might feel great one day and the next day you might feel a little bit tight. If you're going into a tournament, it's kind of good to know that, especially if the weather's kind of off. Uh, now we'll look up and down. Good. Now we're going to roll our uh, sh heads from shoulder to shoulder, making sure that we're keeping our shoulders down. We don't want to shrug at all. So sometimes I like to hold my hands behind my back just to kind of like pull my shoulders down and back and just rolling my head back and forth. This is super useful, especially if you have a desk job and you kind of hunkered over the keyboard all day. Then you got to spend some practice in the evening, just kind of warming up, making sure everything is moving. It's super useful. Good, now we do some shoulder rolls. Rolling our shoulders back, trying to see what our range of motion's like today. See if there's any kind of snap, crackle, or pop. My right shoulder sounds like Rice Krispies some days. Any reverse directions. Good. And now we'll do some big arm circles. Again, go whatever pace works for you. I like to start off a little bit slower and then I kind of add in some speed, really work in my range of motion. So I'm feeling this also working my, my lats. So I feel it here when I'm back here, I can kind of feel my lats kind of uh, extending forward a little bit. Feel it in my chest too when I'm back here, which is kind of nice. Yeah, reverse directions. This is a direction that always gets my right shoulder popping. <laughs> All right, good. Now we're going to do uh, what I call some hugs. So we're just going to keep our arms at shoulder height. And we're just going to crisscross our arms over top of each other. So we're showing us all some love this Tuesday evening. So again, I'm thinking about my chest and back. So when I'm here, I'm thinking about keep trying to open up my chest as much as I can. And when I'm hugging, I'm thinking about really kind of like uh, trying to get my, my back as round as I can up top. All 
Awesome, cool. Uh, now we're going to uh, do some reachbacks. Uh, so basically you're gonna get a nice stable base uh, that's gonna look different for different people. Uh, some people, they might need a much wider base. Other people, some of the more uh, centered, or, I mean, sorry, more narrow spine. So whatever is nice and centered weighted for you is good. And we're just going to, we're gonna keep our hips and legs pointing forward. We're just gonna twist our bodies back. So if you have any kind of back issues, uh, go very slowly, uh, kind of like treat your body nicely, but we'll just pretend like it's like glass of water or whatever our preferred beverage is behind us, reaching for, and then we're just going to the other side. Again, for this one, I go nice and slow to begin with, kind of see how I'm feeling. And if I'm feeling good, I'll go a little bit further. But we are gonna be doing a couple of voids. So this is definitely uh, a good warm up if you're gonna do any kind of body twisting and voids, definitely fit for that one. Good, uh, now we're gonna do some more hip warm ups. So we're gonna pretend like we have a big old hula hoop and we're just going to do some big hip circles. You can tell I did not, was not a very good belly dancer or even a very good with hula hoops. But again, go whatever speed works for you. Really try to feel how your body's feeling that day. You might feel the tension kind of go from the back of your legs to the inside of your legs to the front. It's kind of good and reverse directions. Good. Uh, now we're gonna work, we're gonna open up our uh, hips a little more. Uh, so this is gonna work a little bit of balance. If you need to kind of like hold on to a chair or something, that's fine. We're just gonna lift our leg up and then out and down. So we're just basically trying to warm up our hip socket here. Any extra bonus, you got a little balanced workout, it's kind of nice. Yeah, so just go as high as you can. We're not trying to break any records here. We're just trying to get the body warmed up, kind of have an idea of what our body's letting us do today. Good, and now we're gonna reverse direction. So I'm gonna take my leg and raise it from the side, and then I'm gonna bring it back to my midline. If I was at an event warming up this way, I probably would do this while taking steps forward, kind of like walking and just alternating legs, uh, but limited space, just do stationary. All right, I'm gonna switch legs. So now we're doing our opposite leg. So if you did right, now you're doing left. In reverse directions. Good. Uh, next up, we're going to do some ankle uh, ankle rolls. Or so there's two ways you can do this. One, you can just have your foot on the ground and just feel like you're digging a hole in the dirt, or you can have your foot in the air and just kind of make circles. It's like a really weird hokey pokey version. Again, work some balance, which is good. My left ankle is getting some nice uh, stability work, which is a nice little uh, uh, addition to any kind of workout routine for fencing. In reverse directions. These are also really good if you find that your calves get tight or if your Achilles tendon gets really tight before, during, or after fencing. Uh, doing these can really help relieve that, that, that pain or pressure or discomfort. Good, and we'll switch feet. And reverse directions. Good, almost done with this part of the warm up and then we'll, we'll get into more fun stuff. So we're just gonna warm up our forearms and wrists. We're just doing circles.
It's like rejected hand motions from Doctor Strange. These didn't look cool enough. Yeah. <laughs> Open the portal. <laughs> oh man, it's Wednesday. Jeez, I thought it was Tuesday. I don't, it's 2020. What, what is time? What is time? Yeah, reverse directions. Awesome, great. Uh, now for these final 30 seconds, uh, hit whatever body part you know you need more warm up time in. So if your shoulders, do some more shoulder warm ups. Uh, I'm gonna be doing side to side lunges because I have tight uh, groin muscles. So this helps make sure that I'm lunging properly. So you can follow along with me or if you know that there's another body part that you need to warm up with, that's fine. So for my side to sides, I'm going a little bit wider than shoulder width apart. I'm just sliding my weight back and forth trying to line my knees up with my toes on the side of the leg that's bent. And I'm trying to just glide back and forth. I pretend like it spikes over my head so I don't want to pop up and impale my head. That's no fun. So I'm just trying to glide back and forth, shifting my weight, nice and easy. And if I feel pretty good after a few reps, I might go wider or I might try to go a little bit deeper. This is about as deep as I can get. I'm not very flexible. Let's well make sure I don't hurt myself. Cool. Uh, that's it. Grab a quick drink of water if you need it. So now we're going to do the second half of the walk, uh, which is with the sword, so we'll be moving around a lot more now. Um, so we're gonna be doing a bunch of lunges. So if any anyone who's doing the Ethel Mark Thousand Lunge Challenge, here you can get, you can bang a whole bunch out in a couple of minutes. So we're gonna be doing this kind of like in a circuit fashion. Uh, so we're gonna do 40 seconds of a particular type of uh, fencing action, and then we'll get a 10 second break. And I'm gonna let everyone know what each action is before we do it. Um, so our first one we're gonna be doing, uh, so we'll be going from our, Defensive posture, where I'll kind of where I recline back, this classic Kepper Farrow Gigante like stance with a weight mostly off our back leg. And we're just going to shift into what's called either a forward guard or a forward or an offensive posture. My weight's still all over my back leg. I'm just hip hinging over my lead hip. So if I do this towards the camera, I'm just hip hinging. And I'll go, through, we're going to go through all the different guards um, just to get a good warm. So this is, this is a, posture that we'll be kind of going through while we lunge. Uh, so it's kind of good to kind of warm up by going back and forth. So let me put up my the timer. All right, so we got about five seconds before this gets kicks going. So it's gonna go back and forth for 40 seconds. So if you know the diff, the primary Italian guards of prima, secunda, secunda terza and quarter, you can go through those. Uh, you can also do the closed guards if you know them as well, or you can just kind of keep it here in this more like open position. It's perfectly fine. But I'm really constantly keeping my weight over my back leg and extending the sword first, then the arm goes, then I hip hinge. This is gonna be a little tricky at first, but this is a super usable posture. Awesome. All right, so next up, we're going to be doing lunging in quarter. So quarter, for those that might be new to Italian rapier, uh, is when our palm is up and it protects our inside line. So inside line is anywhere I can hug you. So if I can hug you between my sword and my offhand, that's the inside line. So we're just gonna be going into our forward guard and then lunge. So we'll be doing that for 40 seconds. We've got a few seconds before we get going. So just the same idea, stay with the sword first, go into my offensive posture, then lunge. And go whatever speed is fine. You can treat this like a, uh, an actual conditioning and try to go very fast. I just kind of go out of this very slow, moderate pace because I'm, I'm warming up. I really just try to think about doing good mechanics, making sure my body posture is as good as I can get it. If I'm doing this in front of a mirror, I'm checking my form. 
making sure I'm not sticking my butt out. I do that a lot. So I need to make sure my, my hip butt and hips are underneath my torso and all that good stuff. All right, next up, same idea, but we're gonna be lunging in secunda. So secunda is palm down and it protects our high outside line. So anything that's to the right of me, because I'm a righty, is my outside line of my sword. Yeah, so palm down, arm is nice and straight at shoulder height. So I'll do this one from like a three quarter view. So again, sword goes into secunda, I do my hip hinge and then on my step on. And Grimm's kind of showing off a closed secunda position where my offhand, the offhand is protecting that low line. If you know that, this is a good time to practice that as well. If you don't, you can just keep your arm off behind you like this, or you can kind of chicken weight it so your hand is by your face, but your elbow is profiled, kind of it's thrown back to kind of profile your body. See that in Fabris and Giganti. Either way, either of those options, perfectly fine by me, whatever you like. Cool, so now we're gonna add in a little bit of blade work this time. Uh, so now we're going to do a, a cavity on it, which is a disengage, and then lunge into quarter. So we're going back to that inside line. We're gonna disengage first and then lunge. So we're kind of working our wrists, wrists and forearms a little bit. So now I'm gonna do a disengage, quarter, and lunge. If you have the space, you can do an advance after that disengage. So I do a cavity on it. Extend, then lunge. Cavicione with an advance, extend and lunge. Or you can just, if you don't have the space, just doing a uh, stationary disengage and lunge is good too. Always making sure that sword leads. Want my sword to clear before I move my body so I don't run into my opponent's weapon. We'll make it harder for them to hit me in that tempo. Awesome, so now we're gonna do the same thing, but on the outside line. So now I'm gonna do this in secunda. So I'm gonna just disengage on the outside line and then lunge in second guard. Almost done, almost two more rounds and then we can get into the meat of the class. But I really like to make sure people get a good warm up in first. And at least kind of work on some basics. If anyone that is new to my classes, at least we have, uh, we kind of build up at least some kind of groundwork of similar terminology. So I'm gonna perform my cavicione, advance, I get to my forward guard here and then I lunge. And try not to push the rug from underneath me. <laughs> All right, now we're gonna do a reverse lunge. So real quick, cause we're doing some reverse lunges in plays. So my normal lunge, I'm going forward, reverse lunge, I'm basically just doing a one-legged squat where I'm kicking my leg back out like I'm taking a retreat, but sinking down onto that front leg while extending. Key about this, don't go any deeper or wider than you can get out of. Uh, so if you have any kind of uh, groin issues, you don't wanna pull a groin doing this and it can be pretty easy. So definitely start off pretty shallow uh, and then you can kind of build up a wider and deeper reverse lunge, but definitely be a little bit more careful on this one. So again, I'm gonna extend forward, I'm gonna keep my leg back out, and just kind of basically do like a one-legged squat into my lunge position, yeah. I think a pretty good starting point is not to go any deeper than your, your forward lunge. So if this is as deep as I can lunge forward and get out of it easily, uh, I, I, my reverse lunge, I probably want the same. Because if you get in a lunge that's too deep and you can't easily get out of this, not good times is when if you miss your shot, your opponent's gonna hit you. So extend one legged squat into the reverse lunge. Think I can do that in quarter. Secunda or prima, keeping my head below my sword is all good. All right, cool. All right, that is it for the warrants. Now we're gonna jump into the actual fun part of the class. Turn that up. See any other questions so far? Yeah, so I think I got, I actually think I can, Monson, uh, uh was the one that uh, I think I heard him say about the whole inside being a hug thing. So that wasn't an original. I definitely got that from somebody else. 
but I do like that in terms of a uh, way of describing it. All right, so let me kick up my, my screen share here. So we're gonna talk about approaching the reckless, timid, choleric, and phlegmatic opponent. Um, so these are all four different fighter temperaments um, that we basically see, start seeing kind of creep up uh, with Fabris. He had like a chapter on those four temperaments and also in the same chapter he talks about fighting someone that's stronger or weaker than you or uh, taller or shorter. Uh, then we get to El Fieri who kind of expands that. He takes each of those ideas and has a separate chapter. So he has one chapter on all these four temperaments. He has another chapter on strong versus weak and another chapter on tall versus short. So those are all great chapters. And the super can be super insightful because we're starting to get not just how to defeat, uh, just not like what to do mechanically, but we start getting some tactical ideas of how to approach different types of fighters and stuff like that. Uh, so we're going to be uh, really looking at just these four temperaments and we're gonna look at it from a historical view and then I'm gonna try to translate it into how it might play out in the SCA and HEMA world. Uh, Cause honestly, we're not fighting to the death. So people's fight personalities might be, might kind of show up a little bit differently than uh, these were live blades and stuff. All right, so yeah, we have, again, uh, the four Hippocratic humors of Malaconic, which is timid, sanguine of reckless, phlegmatic, which is cool and collected kind of. And then we got choleric, which is the hothead. And we're gonna see that there's some overlaps uh, between some of these. Um, and something to kind of keep in mind, whether you're follow along just watching or if you're actually gonna be doing stuff, there's one, kind of figure out which bucket you fit in. Uh, like, sure, we wanna know how to approach our opponents, but we might wanna figure out how they can approach us and stuff. So kind of know which one of these buckets you might fit in, super useful. Um, so we can kind of quickly, and also we're gonna to try to figure out how we can quickly analyze opponents and stuff. Um, but one big note is just to realize these are, these are four neat little buckets, which are really nice for like this kind of like faux science-y thing that we're getting out of these manuals and stuff. But there are some good ideas in terms of approaching opponents, but realize that four buckets does not encapsulate every type of opponent you're gonna probably actually run into. Uh, this is just a fun starting point where we can kind of tie in some mechanics and everything uh, with the historical manuals. Um, I kind of realize people on spectrums uh, in terms of how they fight and how they might approach different fighters and different tournaments and stuff like that. So this is a fun little starting point to kind of, kind of get us moving around. Um, but I would don't take these four temperaments as like basic gospel of like, well, you gotta be one of these four or not a fencer or something, I don't know. So the first we're gonna look at is the melancholic fighter or the timid opponent. Uh, some characteristics uh, that we get from the timid fighter uh, from Alfieri and Fabris is they're more likely to approach in very short steps and have a narrow stance. They will always withdraw from engagement. So basically anytime you try to approach them, they're gonna start running away. Uh, and they will parry everything thrown at them and, uh, and their form will fall, will fall apart when attacked and stuff. Um, so I kind of interpret this in terms of our uh, sport rapier setting as maybe like a newer fighter who's like just been fighting for a few months. They know how to stand maybe a couple of basic uh, mechanics and moves and stuff, but they might not have a lot of uh, either a lot of confidence in their ability to fight really well, or maybe they're just so new they just don't have a, a very robust uh, toolkit to be able to approach different opponents. Uh, or maybe they're just very, this is their first tournament, or maybe it's a high, a high stakes tournament. Uh, so there's a little bit more, there's a little bit more anxiety that they're, they're trying to deal with. So they might be a little bit more defensive, more likely to run away and just play more of a defensive game and stuff. I think tournament style also really matters with this. Uh, how someone might approach a bear pit where it's basically where, you know, how many points you can just collect over a couple of hours versus a one and done tourney, huge difference. If you know that you can just, if you die or lose, you just go back to the end of the line. You, you can be a little bit more reckless and a little bit more uh, confident or carefree as it were in your approach. than if, it, if, you know, if I'm fighting Grim and he hits me and well now my day is done until the next tournament and stuff like that. So realize that also tournament also might kind of play into what someone's uh, temperament might be. So how we approach the timid fighter, we want to employ feints. They're gonna be very defensive. We want them to try to get moving their sword back and forth a lot. We wanna use a variety of attacks and footwork. Um, basically just kind of keep them on, make sure they stay on edge and a little bit confused. 
uh, press them with a strong with strong blade control and get them to make moves that we can we want to predict. So basically, we want to the masses say we putting them into obedience. They are doing the thing you want them to do, which makes them very easy to predict. Um, the one big note that the Fabris and Alfieri both mentioned is not to be not to push the timid fighter too too much because then they might be get that like cornered rat or cornered animal mentality where they go from being uh, fearful and timid to a little more reckless, where they might just kind of lash out uh, chaotically. And if you're not ready for that or um, you weren't expecting that and stuff, uh, they could get a headshot on you pretty easily. And then you might feel uh, not so good about pressing them so hard and stuff. So you want to kind of keep them on edge, but not push them too far that they uh, switch gears and stuff on you. So now we're going to go over some basic plays that kind of incorporate these different ideas of how to approach and defeat a timid fighter. So the first, we're gonna, first one we're going to look at is a basic uh, uh, feint. So one thing to know about feints, um, your opponent can either have really two options when you feint at them. They're either going to parry or they're going to attack into it. Um, uh, if they don't do anything, you just continue on with the attack and, and hit them in the face or whatever your target is. Uh, but most likely if you faint at them, they're either going to try to parry it or they're going to try to attack into your feint. So you got to be sure that if you're uh, approaching an opponent, you want them to parry on your feint, that they're going to do that. Otherwise, you need to be ready for both. But with a timid fighter, we know they're going to be more likely to do parries. So this very first basic play, let me just fix my camera here for, so it gets a better view of me here. I can pin this, pin me, pin me. There we go. So in this particular action, we're going to just faint straight at our opponent. And I'm fainting by going into my offensive posture. So sword goes first, I hit pinge over, because I want my opponent, my, I want my opponent to think I'm doing that. I want them to think I'm doing this big lunge at them. So I'm just going to faint, basically doing a sharp extension to for the first half of my attacks. They think that I'm attacking them. They move to parry, so they're doing a parry to basically try to stop that faint. And as they do that parry, I'm going to perform my disengage or cavature to the outside line, close them off in my secunda guard, and then lunge. So if I do this as a fluid action, so here's another thing. If you have trouble with fight visualization, don't worry about what your opponents do. Just worry about what I'm showing you to do. And you can just do that as like a mechanic flow drill. But if you can do fight visualization, that's a great, uh, that's another really good tool set. But it can take, it can be a little tricky to, to work on itself. So don't feel bad if you're like, I just can't picture it. Just follow along what I do. So from back here, I'm going to faint on the inside line. My opponent goes to the parry, cavicione and then strike on the outside for the lunge. So I do this a little bit more fluid. I'm going to faint, disengage, and strike. And the one key about also with this faints and disengages and stuff is I need to make sure that my disengage is in the tempo of my opponent parrying. So if I'm really fast, but my opponent's a little bit slow on the parry, I need to make sure that I'm not disengaging before they move to parry. So if I, if I faint here, I can't start disengaging until my opponent actually moves to parry. So I need to move in that tempo. Otherwise, what might happen is I start to disengage too early. I might bump into their sword and keons. I might run into their weapons and stuff. Uh, and that can get all kinds of ugly for me trying to defeat my opponent here. So when you faint, you don't necessarily want to go out your max speed. Uh, maybe, so not a 10, maybe go more like a seven or an eight. So you can ramp it up if you need to. So I'll faint at like a seven or eight speed, the parry comes, disengage, and now I can be really explosive on my lunge once my blade gets cleared. Just checking how folks are doing, good. Cool. So we can also do this on the opposite line as well. So what we just did was we did an inside feint and struck on my our opponent's outside line and our outside line secunda. We can also do this in reverse. So now I'm going to feint on my opponent's outside line. So again, if, if I'm your opponent, you're fainting uh, basically to the outside of my sword here, to the right of my weapon. Excuse me. Your opponent goes to parry, cavicione around their weapon, close them off in quarter, 
and finish your lunch. And I'll do this on the side as well so you can kind of get all different angles. So I'm gonna faint to the outside line. Again, I'm going into my forward guard here, offensive posture, and making sure that my sword is shoulder height in case my opponent counterattacks through this feint. At least I have my guard and forte protecting my head because that's the closest target to my opponent right now. So I feint, the parry comes, cavicione, turn my palm up so I'm in quarter, and then I finish my lunge. And again, your lunge, you can throw your arm out behind you. You can do the, uh, what I call the chicken wing, where the hand is by your face and the elbow is making a little, little chicken wing here. Uh, you can do different, the different clothes guards, depending on where you're striking and all that stuff. Uh, if I do it again from the front here. So I'm approaching the timber fighter. I faint hard down the outside of the line and get them to parry, disengage around their sword and strike them on the inside. Very basic. Yeah, so, the, so quick question about the hip hinge. So I'm doing the hip hinge as part of my feint. Um, because what the way, the way I launch, so I'm going sword, sword brings my armor forward, which brings my hip, uh, my hip hinge, and then I do the lunge. Uh, if you if you're more like if you just faint, if you're very upright all the time, you just might need to just do an extension for your faint, and then disengage around. But as I'm lunging, I always go into this this forward guard because it gets a lot of my squishy bits away from my uh, my opponent, and my head only becomes the main target that they can easily reach at that point. Yeah, so that could be just a difference of how people like to attack and lunge. Um, so if you're if you're not someone who does the hip hinge, um, perfectly fine. You just your your feint just might be this extension, and then you you disengage in lunge. Uh, so some fighters might need more or less of a believable feint. Um, some people will just kind of feint at like you just kind of like just advance with a slight extension. They might start flailing around. Uh, other fighters might need a little bit more, uh, uh, a little bit more uh, theatrics behind it to really get them to believe that what you're throwing at them is a real attack and not a feint. So I usually will feint by going a slight forward, a forward lean to really make them think that I'm throwing this attack. But the, I think the real key is you want to make sure your feint looks similar to how you start your attacks. If it looks very different, then your opponent's going to be able to pick up on that as a tell, and they're going to realize you're not actually throw an attack, but you're fainting, or you're doing something else. Um, so if you are if you attack and lunge differently than I do, perfectly fine. Uh, the key at that point is to make sure that your feints look like your, your real attacks as much as you can. Yeah, so hand position. So when I'm fainting, I could faint just in turtzer, either on the inside or the outside, or I could faint in the guards. Again, that, uh, that might depend on how much uh, theatrics I need to put get uh, throw into my feints for my opponent to believe it. But if I'm on the inside, I faint here in Terza, the parry comes, I disengage, and then I'll attack in Secunda, so my palm will be down. So this is so Secunda is my outside line parry and guard. If I'm fainting on the outside line, again, I might faint in Terza, or I might faint in Secunda, depending on if my opponent needs that guard to believe it's a real attack. Now disengage to the inside line, turn palm up, so that's my quarter, and that protects my inside line. Does that clear everything up on hand positions and the other questions? Cool. Uh, so those are very basic uh, faint attack drills where you just kind of faint at your opponent, they go to parry, disengage, and strike. Uh, and this is very much an opponent that's parrying uh, more with, uh, by moving the tip back and forth. So the tip is uh, still relatively flat. It's not like perfectly, necessarily perfectly straight, but they're not doing this big vertical parry. So they're really just kind of parrying. They might move the hand a little bit more than they need to for the parry, but the point is more or less online. So they could, if they did catch us, easily extend and repose against us. Now we're going to look at feinting against an opponent that is uh, that has maybe a little bit more of that stronger angle in this sort, so it's a little more vertical. Point is high, hilt is low. This is going to be much more difficult to disengage around because it's a lot more steel you need to move around. A sword that's flat, it's much quicker to disengage around, but the, the, the bigger this angle gets, the more weapon you need to disengage around 
which can be a little more uh, difficult. But we can still use feints against a timid fighter that wants to parry with really uh, big vertical swords uh, by using false edge attacks to follow up our uh, um, initial feints and attacks. So I'm gonna do on this one, um, as again, I'm going to feint on my opponent's inside line as they move to parry. So they're doing this big vertical parry, so I'm not gonna be able to easily get around their weapon without making it a huge movement. So as they go to move a parry here, I'm gonna turn my hand into Secunda now. So I'm on the inside line, turn my hand to Secunda. So this is my false edge, which is the side of the blade that's opposite of my knuckles. So I get a nice strong crossing. I'm gonna do a passing step. So my blade shoots around their parry. And I get my offhand out here to control their weapons. I get my hand on their guard. I can get my hand on their, uh, on their blade, but they basically, they have this big parry that I can't easily disengage around. So I'm just gonna go around it. I'm doing this passing step offline. So if they try to follow back with me, my, well, my offhand is here to pick up their weapon. Uh, and also they just have a lot further to go. And because the point is so high, I'm not super worried about, they're not gonna have an easy time getting that point back online to strike me uh, in the head as I'm making that passing step. I think it's also key to make that movement while they're moving the parry. If your opponent's already finished their parry, so I faint, they finished their parry and now I try doing that move, I'm more likely to get hit. So I need to make sure that I'm doing that passing step and that false edge attack, so that punta dritto, in the same tempo that my opponent is moving. But for just a mechanic drill, if you're not really worried about the timing, because it's hard to work on tempo when it's just you in front of a mirror or whatever, uh, you can just basically do your feint, turn over secunda, and then kind of do your pass. So I do it from this angle, feint, the parry comes, turn into Secunda with a, with a nice false edge crossing, and then pass. So my opponent's weapon at this point is between my sword and my offhand. I might have my offhand on their weapon depending on uh, how far over they are and stuff, but my weapon is shooting around. It's one of my favorite ones to go against, against opponents that have really big vertical parries. It's just to draw out that parry so their point is not near my face, and just kind of pass around it. Keep on going, check and see how folks are doing with this. Let's see if there's any questions coming in. Nope, good. Cool. So, uh, da, 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 da. yeah, I can show you that one again. So I'm on, the, on my opponent's inside line, feint into the inside line. So that's, that's making them do this big inside parry. So they're going to this big vertical parry. Go ahead, turn my hand in Sakona. So I'm, I'm, my guard's in Sakona, but instead of a straight Sakona, like I'm on the outside line, I'm kicking my, my hand out a little bit so I can really move around their weapon. And then I do my passing step. So if I kind of, if I can get more of my feet in the shot here. So I feint. The parry comes, I turn my hand to Sakona for that Punta Dritto, and then I do my passing step. So now my left foot, which is pointing straight at my opponent, or you know, forward anyways. Yes, Punta Dritto. That's how, that's how I learned the name for this one anyways. So I might have a different phrase for it, as it were. Any questions on this one? This can be a little tricky, uh, play a little bit tricky to kind of visualize if fight visualization is a little tough for you. Uh, it's much, makes much more sense when there's an actual live opponent to kind of work with and stuff. All right, so now we're gonna go to another, uh, another play with the timid fighter. So what can sometimes happen is our opponent might stop, as we mentioned before, the timid fighter likes to just leave engagement while also parrying. So they might not just stand here and parry, they might actually start running away and retreating uh, doing parries, which isn't a bad uh, tactic if you're being pressed and you need to keep yourself safe. 
Um, what can happen though, if they, all, if, if they back up very fast or like a lot, or if they just outrange you, like maybe they have, you're a short, shorter than they are. So your range is a little bit shorter than theirs to begin with. Uh, it can be a little bit harder to faint, disengage and strike them because they might be out of your me measure at that point. Uh, so what we can do is we can implement a gaining step to make our lunge a little bit closer than it usually is. So I'm gonna show the gaining step um, in isolation and then we'll add it into the play. So basically a gaining step is I'm gonna take my back foot bring my heel close to my front foot, so my heels are near each other, and then I'll lunge. And this is gonna give me several inches up to a foot on my lunge, depending on how normally, how normal my wide stance is. If you do more already a very narrow uh, foot posture, that gaining step's not gonna give you very much. But if you have a wider stance, it's gonna give you a lot more. So if this is my regular lunge distance, so you can see here on the screen, my hand isn't quite uh, even with my bookcase here. If I do a gaining step first and then lunge, I can touch my wall. So I gain a lot of extra range uh, on the gaining step. But we also want to mask that uh, so our opponent doesn't realize that we're taking that gaining step. And we can do that with the feint. Uh, it's very hard for our opponent to be able to pick, pick up every single little thing we do. Um, they're going to more likely pay attention to the sword because that's the more dangerous aspect of uh, a part of our person. So that means we can kind of do some more fun stuff with our feet and they're less likely to pick up on it. So how this is going to work, I'm going to advance with a feint and into my gaining step. So I'm going to feint, advance, and then bring, get straight into my gaining step here. So this is part one. Feint with the advance into my gain. One more time. Feint with the advance and I bring my back heel up to my front heel. The parry comes. So now I'm going to disengage and then lunge. So now if my opponent is parrying while taking a big step back, I've made sure that I can stay with, within my range by doing that gaining step. So if your opponent does really big retreats with parries or if they just happen to be taller than you and you know you need to kind of pick up those extra four or five inches, the gaining step can kind of help. So if I do this towards the camera as well, I'm going, and this can work on the inside of the outside line. I'm doing a feint to the outside to the inside, but either way is fine. I'm going to feint, get into my gaining step. The parry happens, disengage to my inside line, and then finish my attack. So this is very much like the very the first play we did, which is the feint and then cavitione around their uh, parry and strike. But now we're doing a gaining step so we can kind of steal some measure from them. Yeah, so on this particular one, because I'm bringing my feet very close together, my hinge is going to be very, very moderate. I don't want to go too far over because this is very, it's going to be a little bit more unbalanced than, than I normally like. So if I'm doing a, so if I'm doing a feint while going to my gaining step, it's going to be a very, it's going to be a very slight hip hinge. Like this is me upright. This is my hip hinge. If I'm doing it while I'm fainting, it's just not as deep necessarily as my uh, normal one is because I'm bringing my feet a, a much closer together. That's going to come down to uh, what your balance is like and how you built and all that kind of stuff. Cool. Any questions on that before we move on to the next temperament? We spent a good amount of time on, on the timid fighter. Cool. So I'm going to bring up the next slide and we can work on the next one. Where's my share screen? There we go. There you go. All right, so our next fighter is the reckless opponent. Uh, characteristics of the reckless fighter, very chaotic in their attacks, will rush you without bothering to use proper guards or measure, will use strength and speed over technique, and they're overly optimistic in their own skill. So they're like cheerfully optimistic. Um, so the way I kind of interpret this for the SCA and HEMA setting is uh, this might be a new or intermediate fen level fencer who might have a lot of confidence in skill, but has an abundance of confidence in their own athletic ability. So if you're very fast or very tall, uh, the person or very strong, the more likely to lean on those uh, genetic uh, uh, 
enhancements or advantages as you as it were uh, instead of a uh, fencing technique to try to defeat you uh, the bull so you know people just who like to bull rush in as soon as Leon is called kind of also fits in this reckless opponent um, uh, category or again like if it's a if it's like a bear pit tourney where the idea is win fast die fast get back in line try to rack up as many points as possible people can be a lot more reckless in that type of tournament as well because it it kind of favors uh, quick wins more than good fencing technique. Uh, so, so like those are a few different ways you might see someone be reckless. Um, some ways of defeating the reckless opponent, defend against their initial rush. So by all means, please, so seriously try to start out of measure. I know sometimes our lists are very tiny uh, and you might be kind of pretty close to in measure right from the get-go, but if you know your opponent is a reckless fighter, you definitely for sure want to make sure you're out of measure when lay on is called. Uh, as they step into, uh, into measure, you want to try to re, uh, retreat and strike in tempo as they're stepping forward, especially if they're a bull rusher. They're going to give you a lot of tempos to hit them in. Uh, in an SEA where grappling is less likely or against the rules, depending on your kingdom, a reckless fighter is probably more likely to charge forward to try to get past your point to infight or to catch you kind of unaware. So if they have the dagger, they might try to do the blade swoop and then shank you. Or they, if they're much shorter than you, they might be just trying to run past your point where it's a little bit more safer for them. Uh, good question. Would I put people who are okay with double kills in this category? Uh, I would say probably, yeah. Yeah, like if they're, if they're not really worried about keeping themselves safe, I would say that's pretty reckless. Sure, this is a sport, so they're not actually going to die. But like, if the mentality, if you go into this fight with the mentality that these are sharp and I don't want to get touched, if your opponent's willing to take you to the grave with them, I'd say that's reckless. <laughs> yes, out of measure madness for sure. All right, so now we're going to look at a couple of plays uh, that can kind of we can kind of use to, to to deal with a reckless fighter. So number one, like I said, start out of measure because if you're in measure when laid on is called, they're going to try to jump jump uh, past your point right away. And this, out of the four temperaments, the reckless fighter is the one you need to worry out, worry about when Leon is called right away. The other three, you can kind of figure out which temperament they kind of are. But if you get a reckless fighter and you don't realize it and you're in measure, you're, you're, you're gonna have to start backpedaling pretty fast and move offline really fast. Uh, so definitely start out of measure because that's the one you really need to worry about when Leon is called. So the first one we're gonna work on is going to be a series of retreats into a reverse lunge. Because the idea is our opponent is they're just trying to run us down. They're doing whatever kind of crazy stuff with the blade work, but they're trying to get control of our blade, pass our point, they're running us down and trying to hit us. So we're doing retreats to keep them at our measure. And then we're gonna do a reverse lunge to get below their sword and to let them run themselves onto our weapon. If they wanna run so fast or charge at us so fast, we will let them do what they want to do so well, but also hit them at the same time. So if you don't have room to do reverse lunges, uh, sorry, uh, a bunch of retreats, uh, you can just practice the reverse lunge or just do a small retreat into reverse lunge. Uh, kind of work with your space as best you can. But how this will work is my opponent's coming at me, so I'm gonna retreat, retreat, and I'm gonna just drop right into my reverse lunge. Key here is I wanna make sure that my hilt is over my head if my hilt's down here, my opponent could still hit me in the head while I hit them. I might get them in the tummy because I'm not very tall. So my reverse lunge is going to hit them probably in the stomach or the, or the waist and stuff. But if I have my guard down here, they're going to hit me in the head. It's not good times for me. So I'll make sure that when I drop into that reverse lunge, whether I'm in secunda or prima or quarter, and I'll, I'll bring my hand closer to the screen for a second for those guards. I want to make sure that I'm, my head is behind or at least under, behind or underneath my, my hilt. And I can throw my arm out back here. And as soon as I make that strike, I'm going to recover back and make sure that my weapon is covering their sword in case they still try to come running at me some more and stuff. I'll do this from the front view as well. So I'm going to do a retreat, retreat, and then do my reverse lunge. So this is if my opponent it's a little bit more on my outside, I can be here. Could also do it in quarta. Uh, but the idea, because we're going below their weapon, um, it keeps us pretty safe from them just kind of charging forward, kind of running and reaching out for us and stuff. 
Also, if they're doing more of a blade sweep, you need to be kind of careful where that point is. Uh, and usually, only, more likely going to do that, they have like a dagger or a second offensive weapon. Uh, but if we're just looking at just like single rapier, uh, they're probably less likely to do that. Or if they do that, this is just not a play we would want to, to do against them and stuff. So again, retreat, retreat, reverse lunge. And then I want to recover as quickly as I can from there. So whether we're in Secunda or Quarta depends on whether which whether on which side of the blade we're on because we want our true edge against their blade, right? Yeah, so I want underneath them. So our true edge would probably really just be Prima if we're like truly getting underneath their weapon. Um, I would choose my, I do it a lot in Secunda and I can turn my, just because that's this very comfortable and I can kind of turn my hand here if need be. Uh, if, I'm, if I know I'm gonna get plenty underneath them, I'm not super worried about um, the particular guard and stuff, uh, but it really depends on like where the weapon is and do I think I need, I want to need that extra uh, protection and stuff from it. <laughs> yes, Rex is the real MVP of the class. He always is. <laughs> uh, where do I put my back foot on the reverse lunge, I'm guessing? So if I fix my camera again, ba -ba -ba. so I'm doing my reverse lunge. I'm basically dropping into a very low version of my normal lunge. So my back foot is kind of 90 degrees. Some people might be more comfortable with it turned out more. For me, 90 degrees is comfortable when I go into my reverse lunge. I don't think you want your, I, what I would say you don't want to do is you don't want to start turning to the sprinter pose. Because one, it's going to take, it's going to kick up your, uh, your heel most likely. Uh, and also you're just not as rooted into the ground as well. This, this is made very much for me to push forward to stop running. Uh, but the idea is I am lunging, I want to be able to get back into my defensive posture as soon as I land that hit. Cool. Hope that helped, good question. Any question on this one? Cool, uh, so now let's see. Yeah, so the, in terms of the footwork, you're gonna to to do as many retreating steps or retreating passes as, as you need and such. Uh, I just do two because it just kind of gets me moving and I'm in a small apartment, so I can only basically do uh, retreats. Uh, but basically once you know you're in, your opponent's close enough that if you drop into that reverse lunge, they're gonna keep going forward and run onto your blade is kind of uh, the time or the measure you wanna do it in. So it's gonna probably be closer. So usually I do the reverse lunge when I'm very close to my opponent, but if they're charging at me pretty hard, I can do it from a wider measure because I know they're gonna not gonna be able to stop their forward momentum easily and they're gonna run into my blade and stuff. Um, that's something that's easier to kind of show in, and kind of show off with it with as a partner to kind of like really kind of play around with. Yeah, I'm also moving a little bit slower for like demo purposes. And it really depends on my opponent. My opponent's really charged at me. I'm gonna do really quick, tiny, quick retreats and stuff. Um, I'm moving a little bit slower for the sake of like demonstration purposes because I know Zoom and live streaming can kind of muddy stuff. But yeah, you wanna move at, in tempo with your opponent, but make sure you're keeping yourself safe while still trying to draw them forward at you. So that speed's gonna probably kind of vary. It's a good question. All right, so now we're going to use some invitations to try to invite our opponent to charge at us. Uh, maybe our opponent wants to really run at us, but they know they shouldn't do that as long as this, our sword is pointing at them. And maybe they don't have enough confidence to just clear our blade. So they're looking for some sort of opening where our point kind of drifts to really trigger them to run at us. So we're gonna use some invitations uh, to kind of draw out that response from them. And the first one we're going to do is we're going to do an invitation on the outside line. So I'm on the outside line, my opponent's weapon. I'm just going to let my tip drift a little bit to my inside line so they can strike. If my opponent were to lunge at me or run towards me, they're going to be trying to strike right over across my weapon, kind of towards my uh, musketeer crest here, more or less. So this is my invitation to try to trigger them to run at me. If here, once they start to make that motion of coming at me, I'm going to do a cavicione, clear my, my body back, and do a drop. 
So there's three jhanas we can do, depending on how, there's a few tactical uh, decisions for which jhana we do. The first jhana is on a very oh, interesting place. I'm just gonna turn my, my shoulder always goes first on all three of these. So shoulder goes first while I'm extending. That gets me profile. And then I'm going to basically pivot on the ball of my sword foot to try to just get a little bit extra lean. So now I can lean further back. So if I do this first one, so if I don't have a lot of time, like my opponent's just really close when they, when that invitation attack comes, that might be the big, as big of a board that I have time to do, which is why it's really important to get that shoulder out of the way first, disengage to get my weapon under, clear of theirs. And now I can just kind of hang back and lean back as far as as comfortable as I can. Like don't go any further than you, than you can, for sure. So that's the first kind of draw that we can do. I can also do draw while taking a small step to my outside line. So same way, then I'm gonna do my invitation on the outside line. That triggers their attack. I do my cavicione. I'm gonna take a step towards my right and strike. Again, I'm making sure that I'm still getting my, my shoulder profile here. So invitation, get my body profile. And I take a step offline. And my opponent can run into this. If I need to, I can then break my arm. I can then bend my arm. So like I land that shot because they charge it forward, then I can bend afterwards because uh, I'm not going to be able to run them through, uh, thankfully. Third draw to is the very fancy where we're basically turning our back kind of at them. This is just more if you're front weighted. If your uh, weight's mostly in your front foot, uh, you'll want to do this draw to, or if you need to really cover a lot of distance. Uh, so if you're on a short offense or against a tall offense that's trying to run you down, this is a draw that works good for that. So it's going to be a similar idea. My invitation is the outside. The opponent goes for the attack, so I'm disengaging underneath. I'm going to start off by doing that first jrata, so that jrata stabile. And then I'm going to do a passing step with my back foot behind my lead foot. So this is that very fancy pose. Look very dainty, frilly. Very pretty, but you have to land a shot. You can just moonwalk off the list. It's very nice. So I do this towards the camera. Invitation on the, on the outside line, the attack comes. Disengage, get in the body profile, and then step through. And this step through can be as big as I need. So I could do a really big pass, or I can just do a very small one. If I don't need to really like make up a lot of distance and stuff. Also, I apologize for my radiators going off. Go through a few of these again. So invitation on the outside line. The opponent's trying to run me down through the outside line. So I do my cappuccione while clearing my blade. And I can just do either of those three jirata. So that's that first one where I'm just kind of like putting my weight on my front leg. I'm just kind of leaning back as far as I can. So now my opponent's blade is basically out here. Their blade is normally aimed kind of here at my center line here. I'm basically trying to get around. So they keep on going. Their blade passes me and I've stabbed them. And you can throw your arm out behind you, like you see in Captain Farrell. So you can have that uh, uh, arm straight out behind your profile. Or again, you can kind of do the chicken wing. I like the chicken wings for my voids because it keeps my offhand close to the action. So if I miss this jrata and my opponent's weapon's in my face, I can now reach out, pick up their blade, and then kind of do whatever other action I need to from there. But my arms thrown out behind me, I need to bring all the way back to get it uh, to be useful defensively. But that chicken wing can kind of help me uh, if I screw up my, my void at all. Any questions on that one? Cool. Yeah. <laughs> sure thing, Bella. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think either one is good, but like with something like the void, especially if you don't practice voids a lot, it, does, it can go wrong. It can go sideways, uh, literally and figuratively, a lot faster. So having the offhand there is kind of nice. All right, next player we're going to look at. I'm just seeing the time. Cool. Uh, so we're going to do a. Da, 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 where's my notes here? All right, we're going to. Oh, cool. 
So now we want to do basically kind of a void to the other line. So this was our void to our towards our outside line. Now we're going to kind of do a void to the inside. Uh, so one thing I mentioned before is when we're throw feints, we can expect our opponent to either try to parry it or try to attack into it. This play assumes our opponent is more likely to attack into it. So maybe our opponent's a reckless fighter, but they want us to extend our sword closer so they can get a control of it somehow and then charge at us. So they're looking for some sort of little bit of an extension so they can try to get control of our weapon and then run us down. So what we're gonna do on this one is we're going to, oh, let me just double check my notes, sorry. Yeah, All right, so I'm going to faint to the inside. So now my opponent's trying to control my weapon. I'm, as he goes or they go to pick up my weapon, I'm going to drop my tip. And I usually do it by turning my hand from Terza into Secunda. So I'm fainting on the inside, faint on the inside line. They go to basically counterattack into it. I lower my tip. I'm just going to step off to my offhand side or my left hand side. So again, their weapon is going to be above my sword most likely. I'm going to have my offhand kind of on the other side of my face in case they try to bring their point back online to where I am. I have something kind of there. If I had a dagger or a buckler, I could also kind of hold it out here for even better protection. But basically, they're seeing us extending. So now they're just trying to take their uh, weapon and kind of just run us down. So they're very forward motivated. They're not being very careful about their approach. They just see our weapon extended and they're gonna to try to take it and then charge us down. So we need, so they're giving us a very quick uh, uh, tempo to kind of work in, but they're very dedicated or invested in their uh, blade control and running us down. Which is why when we faint and they start their attack, we can lower our tip to make sure they don't have control of it and just step offline. And again, it's, it, because they're moving very, forward fast, they run right into our weapon. So you got faint, they start to come forward, drop the tip, and step off to the side. I do this from profile view. Faint, my opponent attacks, drop the point, step off the side, offhand, kind of like by my face, or if a dagger by my face, just in case they try uh, basically bring, swinging his sword wildly back at me. Yep, so faint, dropping the tip down. So my so when I'm doing this, uh, uh, I faint, um, my faint's up high, and then I keep my sword on, so that height, but I'm just turning my hand to Seconda and let my tip drip. So my tip is, so I'm basically hitting my opponent kind of in that stomach flank area, but I'm still keeping my sword at shoulder height. Because I never, I always want to try to keep my sword at shoulder height as often as I can, because if I start dropping it, especially if I'm a little bit more forward or whatever, or if I just drop it here, this becomes a really big target for my opponent to hit. If I can hit my opponent or keep myself safe from them hitting me by keeping my, sh my sword high, I can just dip my point that way. Yeah. Cool. Yep, yep. And you can do, yeah, you can do that forward step like we do with some other plays. If they're really charging at you, you, you just might need to step sideways to kind of closer to uh, uh, like seven or eight o'clock on the dial because they're doing all the work by running at us. We just need to get our bodies offline. Any questions on this one? Cool. Uh, we're going to do one more play for the reckless fighter, and this is going to involve using our offhand. Uh, so we can use this with like an open offhand, or we can also use it with a dagger or whatever. Uh, sorry, question just came. Is the idea of dropping the tip ends up being an attack because they got onto it? Yeah, so basically, like, this, my feint is up high. Uh, they're trying to control my weapon. So I'm dropping the tip so they don't, so my, my tip is free. If I keep my weapon up here and just step off to the side, I might hit them, or they might just be able to can, can keep control of, my, uh, control of my weapon. But by dropping my tip, when they think it's going to be up high, they can't control my weapon now. So yeah, they are going to run onto it. So they're doing most of the work by running forward and I'm just free my blade so it can hit them easier while stepping offline so I don't get hit. Yeah, no, that was a good question. Because you're not really doing much of anything. You're just kind of like dropping the tip and stepping offline, but sometimes it can be that easy. 
Not every fight's that easy, but it's nice when it is. All right, uh, so the next play, we're gonna use the offhand. So I'm doing this with the open offhand. You could do this with, with a dagger. Works all more or less the same. The dagger just gives you a bit more reach. Um, we're gonna get a little bit of offhand work into this. So again, I'm going to, so I'm, I'm going to be doing this for what I call, for what's called like a closed position. So your offhand can be in like two main spots, up by your face, which is often called an open position, or you can have it by the crook of your elbow when you're on guard, and that's a closed position. So this is working from this closed position, specifically. So I'm on guard, I have my hand by my crook of my elbow, Again, I'm going to give my opponent a little bit of an invitation on the outside line, which triggers them to run at me. As they do that, I'm going to perform a cavicione to uh, free my tip from their attack, pick up their weapon with my offhand, slip my uh, front leg back, and strike him in this closed quarter position. So this sword is actually on the palm of my hand, and my tip is free, pointing below the sword again, striking them in the waist area. So if I do this on the side, I'm here, I give them that outside invitation. So they're just trying to strike me over my sword. So I do my disengage to free my weapon, get my offhand to pick up their blade, slip my leg back, just in case I need to keep on running afterwards. I'm just starting the process of getting my, uh, my mo momentum in reverse. And my hand is connected to, the, my, to my hips, to my pummel. So there's no gap between my weapons. My sword arm is still high. So if I do this without the offhand portion of it, so this is the invitation, I'm, my arm is still at shoulder height. My tip is just pointing down again. So now my offhand is covered in the high line, so it's protecting my face, and it's picked up by opponent's uh, sword. And, this, and what, the reason why I like this from this closed position is that because they're trying to strike towards my, uh, let's say my sternum here. My offhand, everything is going in this, this direction. My offhand is always basically going from my right to my left, which makes this a very easy macro to kind of like program into my brain. So I give the invitation, the attack comes, I disengage, get into that closed position while slipping my leg back. And then I hit them. I want to withdraw and cover their weapon depending on which line they're on. Yeah, so this, so the move from third to fourth, it's like, it's not like a full cavicione, it's like a, more like a half cavicione, so like a uh, half disengage. Uh, if I bring my weapon here. So I'm giving that invitation on the outside line. So they're trying to strike basically in terza or seconda if they're even using a guard, um, but I'm basically letting them try to run me down over my weapon here. So as that starts to happen, I'm just doing a small disengage just basically to get my point down. So I'm in like this turtzer, uh, uh, turtzer quarter position, free my blade, and then finish off into quarter. I do it from this angle in here, and then there. This is a counterclockwise action. Yeah, but it's not a full disengage. You're really just kind of dropping your tip to be below their weapon. Yeah, I mean, you could also invite purely in a quarter. So like I kind of do this towards a quarter position, but you could be straight in quarter. So I could be inviting the outside line this way, still in that closed position. So now when they kind of try to gain your, your weapon, you can just basically drop your tip by just kind of like relaxing your grip a little bit to drop it and then pick up their weapon. I like, I find disengaging in turrets are more comfortable for me. You might find disengaging already in quarter uh, more comfortable for you. You could be, if you, if you guess you wanted to, you could be on that outside line, kind of turn your hand into Secunda 
uh, sorry, uh, yeah, I want to be here because that would be awkward. Um, yeah, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't do from Secunda, but that turret's a quarter position or quarter, I think are the two, the two best ways of doing that one. Yeah. So when it comes to disengage, so like Alfieri really likes disengages in quarter. Uh, I like it better in turrets. So I think it's one of those play around with which guard feels best for your, your wrist position and stuff um, and kind of go with that. That might change up how you set up a play, but the basic idea of set up on the outside so you can pick up their weapon as they attack on the outside with your offhand and clearing your sword all works. You might get there slightly differently, but those basic kind of like checkpoints of the action kind of still work. All right, uh, running a little bit slow. That's my fault. Let's go to the next opponent. So this is the phlegmatic opponent. Uh, so they're very confident, but not overconfident. So uh, they describe as having an unconcerned expression. They're prudent in their attacks and defense. They use strong guards. Their movements are methodical and calculating. They're cold and collected. They have unblinking eyes. So I kind of see this as being kind of like the paragon of a duelist. They're like cool and collected. Like you know that they're, they're confident in what they can do skill-wise. Maybe they have a bunch of victories already under their belt to kind of back up their uh, this kind of like uh, bravado of, yes, I know what I'm doing out here. Uh, it's going to be much harder to, to defeat this kind of opponent uh, just because they are so uh, highly skilled and more comfortable in what they're uh, in their stature or their, their skills and stuff like that. Um, there are some ways that we can defeat them because no one is uh, perfect. To defeat the phlegmatic opponent, uh, you want to attack with resolution and take the initiative. So basically, if you play way too defensively and give your the phlegmatic opponent all the time in the world to do whatever they want, you're kind of playing into their hands. Uh, you want to use boldness to get them to experience fear or anxiety to make a mistake. And that's going to be really key. Uh, use good technique and follow the rules of your system. Uh, so if you fight Italian, you want to use good Italian techniques. If you do Destreza, you want to use good Destreza techniques, all that kind of stuff. Uh, use invitations. So you put them into obedience and then use tempo to gain control of the weapon or to strike them. And if you can't confuse them, strike them in the tempo as they enter the measure in the most uncovered or least protected opening. Um, so this is definitely uh, the most difficult to opponent we're going to run into. Let me just get my, switch my notes over here. Um, and in terms of, if anything, this kind of opponent's going to play a, bit, a little bit more defensively. Like they might be very, uh, they're not going to be as defensive as say like the Tibbet fighter. Uh, but they're not like the reckless fighter that's just going to charge forth at you. They might approach you, but it's going to be very careful. It's going to be very calculated, very methodical. They're going to seek to control your weapon, make sure they're safe uh, so they can strike you uh, when they have as much control over your weapon as possible and stuff. Uh, so this first play we're going to do is we're going to find them. They're gonna, we're going to find their sword. They're going to do a disengage. We're going to do a counter disengage and then lunge to hit them. So I'll show this as a mechanical drill here. So the idea is, as we seek to find their weapon, they do a disengage. So we need to do a counter disengage as they're doing their disengage. If we find their blade, they do the disengage and they finish their disengage and then we start moving, they're now in control of our weapon and therefore in control of what we're doing. So we make sure as they disengage, we're doing our disengage right along with them. So this, so if anything else, practice a lot of disengages at home or with partners and stuff like that. So you get really good at being very quick and fluid about it. The bigger your disengage, the slower you are. So you really want to practice nice tight disengages. But as I kind of a solo mechanical drill, I'm stepping in to find my opponent's weapon. They disengage, I counter disengage, and I'm going to strike. So I think they're very slow. So you can see all the pieces. So I'm doing this binding with an advance. So I, sword goes first, then the advance comes, they disengage, I counter disengage and lunge. So what your opponent's doing, just to play switch roles, your opponent's seeing you to seek their blade, so they're just basically disengaging to either control your weapon, to which as they do this motion, you're doing the counter disengage and strike. Or they might be doing, as you're stepping to find them, they might be doing a disengage to try to strike you as you're, as you're stepping in. So now as you do that counter disengage, you're still controlling the weapon and striking them. And if all your opponent's doing is super confusing because by visualization, just practice your 
finding with the advance a disengage and a launch. Because <laughs> I know five visualization can be super tough. So can practice that a few times. Extend sword first, I go to find, disengage, and launch. Extend with the advance, disengage, and launch. And also, like I need to, do, I need to do this my counter disengage and lunge in the tempo of my opponent doing their disengage. Uh, once they finish their disengage, they're going to be able to react much easier to what I'm doing and stuff. Uh, so we definitely make sure that we're moving quicker than they are, or their action or their disengage has to be bigger than ours and stuff. And there's a lot of stuff that's easier to uh, kind of play around with in person with partners and stuff. So don't super worry too much about that, but kind of keep it in the back of your head. So I set to find, disengage, and strike. And that works on both sides. So that one, when I was finding on the inside, disengage and then strike and still in quarter. I can also do it on the outside line. So I step forward, trying to find them on the outside. They do their disengage, counter disengage, and lunge. Yeah, I need to do that. Counter disengage and lunge, all the tempo of their action and stuff. Cool. Any question on that one? It's a pretty simple play. Awesome. So the next play we're going to look at uh, is basically we're going to kind of assume that we're a little bit further away than that first play. So that first play, we're a little bit closer. Uh, this next one will be further out, but it's going to still kind of work some similar ideas. So we're still trying to take the initiative by finding our opponent's blade so they can't easily strike us. Move forward, make sure that basically force them to try to clear their blade and just we're going to keep following them and strike. Uh, so how this play, this basic one will work is I'm going to find my opponent's blade, take an advance. They're going to do a, a disengage. So I do a contra dis disengage, counter disengage, keeping them on my inside line. So now I'm much closer. So maybe our sword is across closer to uh, the half point of our sword at this point. Now they do another disengage. I'm not going to do a second disengage because we're so close. I'm gonna just turn my hand over from this quarter position into Secunda and strike. So this is called the Vault Estable where we're just turning our hand from one guard to the other. So basically them, I just to kind of isolate the blade actions here, I'm doing a finding with an advance, one disengage, a Vault Estable to the outside line and strike. And this works on both lines. So I could start off on the outside and finish on the inside. So I just a little bit closer, so you can see the hands a little bit easier. Fine in advance, I do a counter disengage. They do another disengage. I now I'm turning my hand over to close them off and on the outside line. In lunge. Disengage, pull the star blade, and then lunge. So the idea we're working on is we've, we're seeking to control their weapon. We get control. We want to keep getting control and until our opponent gives us a good tempo, we get close enough to hit them. Cool. Uh, now we're going to use a different, slightly different tactic for our opponent here. On this particular one, we're going to give our opponent an invitation. So one of the uh, ideas that was brought up by Fabris and Alfieri is to give your the phlegmatic opponent um, invitations because they're they really want to make sure that they're striking uh, as safely as possible. So if we kind of give them an invitation, we might be able to trick them into thinking that 
uh, that is a mistake that we're making. Uh, so which when they try to, to capitalize on it, they're giving us the action that we want so that we can hit them. So what we're gonna do in this particular one is we're gonna give an invitation on the outside line. So they're gonna, our opponent's gonna to seek to find our weapon. We're gonna do a cavaccione into a beat parry and then lunge and strike our opponent. So fix my, fix my mat. Don't slide around, here we go. So yeah, I'm on this outside line here. I'm gonna just kind of let my point drift a little bit to make my opponent think that I've made a mistake and they can easily strike or at least find my weapon on this outside line. As I seek to do that, I'm going to do a disengage into the beat parry. So I'm doing a disengage coming up, beating with my true edge. I'm kind of aiming, trying to use like a kind of like a third down my blade on like a quarter of theirs. I don't want to try to beat their blade too close to the tip because I might miss. Meanwhile, if I use the tip of my blade, um, I can get a lot of velocity, but, it's enough, but it doesn't hit as hard. So we're trying to balance between the mass of the weapon with the velocity, which is why I kind of like to use that like third-ish down the blade, hitting kind of around about a hand span or a quarter down their blade. That's like a rough estimate for where we're aiming at here. So it's the invitation, disengage, beat their blade, extend, and strike. So I'm striking in quarter because I'm invited on the outside. I do this from this three quarter angle. Inviting the outside line. They either seek the blade or maybe they're actually attacking me is probably better for this one. So that they seek, as I give the invitation, they're trying to gain and strike me here. Circular, uh, do my disengage into the beat. And I could do that with a disengage if I need to give myself a little bit of extra uh, breathing room. That knocks their blade out of the way. I extend to close out the line and launch. Invitation, beat, and attack. And on this particular one, um, sometimes I'll keep my hilt a little bit lower than I normally would on the attack, only because they like knock their blade down. So if someone's knocked my blade down, as I bring my blade, it's gonna be coming most likely from this kind of like lower diagonal. So I want to make sure that I have some something in the way. So if I'm just doing this with single rapier and I beat my opponent's blade, I really kind of knock their sword down as I lunge. I might kind of, instead of having my, this dice perfectly straight lunge with my arm, I might let the hit the hilt be a little bit lower just in case the sword comes up. I have some kind of steel there to pick it up and they can't just slide underneath and clip my arm or get me in the flank or whatever. Nice. Any questions on that one? Cool, now we're gonna do the, the similar play, but we're gonna throw a feint in after the beat parry. So we're just gonna work on a few different ideas, bringing back some plays that we've been using. So it's gonna be the same idea. I'm giving this outside invitation. My opponent is attacking me on the outside. I do the beat parry, so the sword's been knocked away. Now I'm going to feint because maybe my opponent's very quick on their parries after being beat, or maybe I didn't beat their weapon super hard. So I think, because now they're trying to bring their weapon back up to control my weapon. So I beat their, I beat their weapon, I faint. As they go to parry my faint, now I can disengage around their weapon and strike. So now I'm gonna be striking them actually on the outside line. So I'm fainting on the outside, they attack me on the outside beat them on the inside line by doing that disengage or like a circular parry. Faint to draw that parry to come back up, disengage around that parry and then strike. So what we're kind of working on is we're given the phlegmatic point of the in invitation to make them feel a little bit more secure in their attacks. Uh, once we beat their blade, it's gonna raise their anxiety a little bit. So they're gonna be more likely to do a big wild parry uh, while we're for the faint, so then we can move around them and strike and stuff. Mutation, beat, faint, disengage, and then lunge.
It's a little bit more of a complicated thing, but it works also a whole bunch of different blade actions, uh, which is kind of nice in terms of a mechanical drill as well. Uh, it really kind of encompasses a, a bunch of different blade actions to kind of work on. So let me grab a quart drink of water here. Cool. Uh, we're going to do another uh, play before we get into the last um, the last temperament. Um, this one we're going to use is it's going to work a couple again. We're going to work a couple of other mechanics that we've used before. Just kind of kind of bring it back. This is going to be a invitation on the outside line as they seek to find our blade. We're going to faint by Cavaccione, hide to their face. So when they go to parry, we're going to drop our tip and basically. Uh, uh, do a passing step to get around it. We'll do like a low Posada Soto. There are a couple of different options we have. So I kind of walk through this one again. I'm giving my opponent invitation on the outside line. So they're just, they're just stepping in to try to seek control of our weapon. They're not attacking, they just, they see the opening. So now they're trying to control us on the outside line. That's what we're trying to get them to do. As they do that action, we're going to disengage and faint high at their face. And the key here is I want to aim for their face because I'm trying to get them to raise this, their health a little bit higher to parry. If I faint low to their stomach, all they need to really do from their basic on guard stance is just kind of move their tip over. If I faint towards their face, they're more likely to raise their hilt as well to make sure they get enough of their strong on our weak. And by doing that, that kind of exposes that lower flank. And this is what I'm trying to open up. I want to hit them right in that flank of that rib cage, which is why I'm aiming to the face. So I give them the invitation, they seek to, to find faint high in the face. As they go for that parry, again, I'm going to drop my tip by turning my hand from this uh, uh, turret or even quarter position into Seconda, and I'm going to do a low pass. So if I do this from further back, faint high to the face, Disengage my point low, keeping my still sword high, and doing a low pass. So if you can't get super low, you can just do this as basically just a regular pass, and you want to get your offhand more out there to uh, kind of keep control of your opponent's weapon in case it comes back at you. Uh, but you still want to do that high feint and then drop in the tip. Um, doing the Posada Soto or any kind of on a low void just keeps me a little bit safer because I'm getting well below where the tip is. Um, but if you just don't have the, uh, the, if you currently don't have the athletic ability or mobility to be able to do that, you can just, you can still do it with a regular passing step. You just need to be a little bit more careful and get your offhand to play a little bit more. <laughs> yes, how, how to kill, how to kill Illidor one-on-one is play right here, I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm going to faint high to the face to get them to go for that parry. Drop my tip. I'm still keeping, again, I'm still keeping my, my sword, my arm high. My tip is low. So I faint high to the face, drop my tip low, keeping my sword here. That draws that higher parry. Faint up here, draws the higher parry, drop the tip. And now I'm just taking a passing step. This is, this is the not Passata Soto version. This is just a more upright pass. So it's going to look very similar to some of the earlier plays we did. But instead of shooting around my opponent's weapon, my point is underneath theirs. So if I'm your opponent, I still have to find, you faint high in the face. They're basically doing a parry kind of like this, exposes that lower flank. So your tip is underneath, underneath the hilt, hitting them here while you're stepping towards their uh, outside. So yeah, you can totally do this with a faint high, tip low, and then just kind of step towards like 10 or 11 o'clock to kind of get a little bit off the center line. Uh, but if you can do the Posada Soto, that's going to keep you even safer. Also, if you land that shot, you look really cool. And that's always kind of nice. You can do, again, you can do, do the nice moonwalk off the list. So, paint high in the face, tip low. I'm going to bend my body to the inside line here. And I'm just doing a pass. So, if I see if I can get my feet a little bit better into the view so you can see how I'm doing this Posada Soto. Paint high in the face, drop the tip low. 
bending to my inside line. Keep them again. Keep my my head below my sword. I don't want my I don't want this. My head is wide open, so I make sure that my head's below my sword. Keep when I do my pasada so I'm keeping my foot at this like 90 degree angle. And I have to keep my offhand by my face. Again, just as backup. If I had a dagger, get the dagger here as well. We've got a buckler, get the buckler there. You can do it with your foot pointing forward while doing it. If you just can't get as low. So I could do the uh, faint high, get the tip low, and then do a low pass this way where my back foot is now pointing forward. That's perfectly fine as well. Uh, it's just harder to get super low. But you might find that more comfortable depending on how you built. So I think it's worth playing around with both of those. And then one, one that I say about the low voids, if you keep practicing it, um, as long as you're relatively healthy, you should, you'll get better at it. Uh, it just takes a little bit of practice and patience, uh, especially if you're not used to moving in those kind of particular directions and stuff. Any questions on, on that one? Cool, let me just check my phone, see if there's anything on Facebook. Nope, we're good. So I'm gonna go to our last, our last opponent. All right, the choleric opponent. Characteristics it can be very similar to the reckless fighter. Um, they're very impatient and swift to anger, so they're very hot-headed. Uh, they're uneasy in their emotions, they're restless. They're ferocious in their skill in fighting, so that you, they might be described as being overly aggressive which is kind of very much like the reckless fighter. They're very like offensive forward-minded thinking uh, and they throw a lot of shots. Uh, in the SEA or the HEMA, uh, the fencer might be highly skilled like the phlegmatic opponent, uh, but while the phlegmatic opponent has the virtual patience to wait for the right opening attack, the choleric opponent has a little, little bit less of patience. Um, this could be like, maybe it's again, it's a time tournament. There's five minutes left where they can rack up as many po uh, points as they need to, to win. Uh, and they just get a little impatient because they know the score is tight and they only have like five minutes left. Or maybe it's just they're very impatient about everything and they're more likely to just kind of charge forward before they really have the right moment to try to hit you and stuff. So yeah, so they're very like the reckless, but while the reckless fighter uh, is very incautious or like sometimes described as cheerfully optimistic, uh, their, their choleric opponent is just impatient. Um, but it sometimes, but it might play out and the plays we use can look very similar because of that. Some ways of defeating this opponent. Uh, first, don't rush at them. Uh, you want to stay well poised. That doesn't mean you can't move forward. It just means you don't want to like bull charge them at all. You want to make sure you approach them cautiously because uh, they are going to probably try to hit you very fast. They're going to throw a lot of shots. Uh, utilize parry posts. Uh, try to get them, if you know they're going to throw a lot of shots, be ready to parry and repost them or hit them in contra tempo if you have control over their weapon. Uh, Alfieri and Fabrice to chastise them, aka trash talk, and we'll get to that in a second, to kind of infuriate them more, basically make them more impatient. Uh, and once they get tired, because, you know, like the anger can only last so long, the patience can only last so long, um, once they get tired, now you can kind of press them a little bit more. So you can kind of wait them out and then take advantage when they kind of come off that adrenaline rush. And also provoke attacks and strike as they move in. All right, so quickly to go back to the chastise them or trash talk, I am not at all promoting the idea of trash talking uh, your fellow fences in a tournament. I think that is bad sportsmanship. Uh, that sportsmanship is very important to me as a fencer in general, especially as a mod and stuff. But I think we can still use this idea of uh, our opponent being impatient to our advantage uh, so we're really going to focus on, so like Fabrice is to augment the, your opponent's fury to, to make them make a mistake. Instead of uh, um, chastising them or trash talking, we're going to augment, augment that fury or impatience uh, in other ways. But I wanted to put that in there for the sake of the historical uh, fun bit of trash talking your opponent to making a mistake. Please don't do that in a tournament. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> whatever you say, stinky fans, it's true. It's true. All right, so what first we're gonna work on is a basic parry repost, right? So we know our opponent, he's impatient, he's just gonna, or they're impatient, they're just gonna be throwing a ton of shots at us. So we need to make sure that we can defend it. So we're gonna talk about a good parry and a good repost. So if I'm parrying on my inside line, what I don't want to do is I don't wanna move my whole sword over because that really super exposes my outside line. 
if maybe they don't attack me, but they just faint on the inside and I do this, they can now hit me on the other side. Now we become that timid fighter who did the really big parry and they can use uh, some of the actions that we were just talking about earlier in the class against us. So what I want to parry is I just want to parry by moving my tip over theirs. So if they're attacking me on this inside line here, so they're aiming for my sternum, I'm just moving my tip to cross over their weapon so my two edge is facing theirs. My hand, as you can see, is still in the same space. It just turns a little bit. I'm not bringing my hand across my body. I am just letting my tip go over their weapon. And what this does is it creates a nice little slope that I'll, as they throw the attack here and I get that crossing, will redirect their weapon into my hilt or my forte where I have all the leverage in the world and they're not gonna be able to push my blade, my sword out of the way. So I'm basically giving myself this nice strong angle that they slide into my hilt. And then from here I can extend and strike. And depending on how invested their lunge is, I might only need to extend my sword to repost it's so like if they're doing a very big or very invested lunge at me and I parry, I just might need to extend and maybe hip hinge forward to strike them in the head. That might be all I need to do. Um, if they're much taller than me or maybe their lunge isn't as deep or as invested, I might need to then lunge while I repost. But my parry is still crossing with my, uh, my, my point over their weapon so they slide into my hilt. I extend, hip hinge, and then I can do whatever footwork attack I need to. So I could do my, I might need to do my regular lunge. I might need to just do a small lunge because they're only a little bit away from me. If I might just need to do a forward extension. If you're a tall fighter and you face, uh, you're fighting someone shorter than you that's, that's very like hot-headed or throws a lot of shots like that, you just might need to parry or post without really having to move your feet at all. So that's something you need to play around with, uh, with partners and stuff. Uh, but we also want to make that parry or post as quick as possible. So it's not like I'm doing parry repost. I want that parry or post to be as seamless as possible. So if I was trying to do this a little bit more at speed, I'm going to parry or post. I parry to control the weapon and then I'm reposting back. Because once my opponent finishes that attack, now they can recover back. But if I, if I parry and then repost while they're still trying to... Uh, basically adjust their uh, weight distribution and shift back, uh, they're not gonna be able to easily defend themselves. So sign of the practice when you do this with partners is really practice that quick transition between your parry into your post. And that works also on the outside line too. So I could parry on the outside line. Again, I'm crossing just with my tip over their weapon. My hand is still basically in the same spot. That way they slide further into my forte, my hilt. And then I can do my hip hinge to extend for the repost. If I need to, I can do a lunge to make up the rest of the distance. So that's how I approach my parry repost, nice and simple. Uh, we can also use some fancy or sneaky footwork to kind of basically uh, annoy our opponent to make a mistake. Uh, this pattern I got from uh, Dory Koblenz out of the Ketter uh, School of Arms. I got to work with her at VIS over the, uh, uh, the winter. So um, this is from her, I wanna give her credit on this, this footwork and stuff. So what we're going to do is we're gonna do a couple of advancing steps, then a retreat to kind of just get our opponent uh, into a rhythm. Then we're gonna do two advances, a half retreat and a lunge forward. So I'll walk through this and then I'll kind of explain uh, what we're trying to get our opponent to do it as well. So I'm basically doing two advances and then a retreat. Then I do two advances, a half retreat, lunge forward. And how many times I need to actually do this? So this is, um, we've, this is basically a very formulated um, drill of advance, advance, retreat, advance, advance, half retreat, lunge. Uh, when you're doing this in an actual fight, don't, you don't need to be like that uh, programmed about it. The idea is we're trying to get our opponent to start to chase us. So if I'm here and I advance and I advance, they might be getting ready to, uh, 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 they might be either retreating back themselves or they might be getting ready to throw a shot, but then I retreat back. They realize they can't just do their regular lunge to hit me. They need to do something bigger. So now I've kind of got them thinking that they need to do a super big lunge. So now when I do my two advances, when I start to do my retreat back, that's gonna, I'm trying to trigger them into that big lunge. 
or at least they come forward a lot. So maybe they're further away and I just want them to kind of close measure a little bit. I take a small step back and then lunge forward. But is it, I'm trying to get my opponent to give me a tempo of stepping forward, of chasing me that I can now hit them in, which is why I'm doing that half retreat lunge. So the half retreat, if my normal retreat, I'm taking my foot back here and then bring my whole body back. I'm just bringing my foot back a smidge. So instead of several inches, it's just a little bit. It's just the idea of getting my opponent to think that I'm retreating back before I throw myself forward. Well, lunge forward, I should say. Throw is not a good way of describing that. I'm trying to get my opponent just to think about, all right, all right, they're coming, they're coming. They step forward and then I hit them. So we're basically using footwork to kind of program our opponent into chasing us. And the way this can kind of annoy our opponent is we're very much like, if I'm finding someone who I know is very impatient, I just keep coming in and then I run away and I keep coming to board and I run away just before we get into engagement. They're going to get annoyed by that maybe after a while and they might do something more desperate, like trying to run me down or take a big footwork advance and stuff to try to find my blade or, or something else that gives me a big tempo to hit them and stuff. So I'm basically just being a little gnat, just, just playing on the cusp of their their measure where they might want to attack me to get them to make a bigger action that I can take advantage of. So we can do a uh, another kind of version of this where we're doing a kind of a little bit more uh, defensive or minded uh, footwork. So we do a little bit more retreats. So it's going to be the same idea in which I'm doing a retreat, a retreat, and now I'm doing one advancing step. So this is my just basic play for practicing. So I'm doing two retreats and then advance forward. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to program my opponent to think, right, they're running to run away, but now they're stepping forward. So I want them to think that they can hit me as I'm taking that step forward. So again, maybe they're on the cusp of my opponent's measure here and I'm running away, I step forward and then I'm taking some more retreating steps right after. So they see that once in a while I take an advancing step forward and I want them to think now that's the tempo I need to hit them in. I want them to think that I'm making a mistake or I'm giving them a beautiful chance to hit me. And that's when I trick them into taking and make their big action that I can hit them in. So I break this rhythm is I will take retreat, a retreat. I will stop my advance. And then I can either do one or two hours. I could go right into a reverse lunge if my if I think my opponent's gonna start to charge at me. So if I think they're gonna become reckless at that point, I can just drop into my reverse lunge. Or what I can do is as I do this half advance, I can extend my arm and then retreat back. And maybe I can get a hand shot on them. Or if they're very, if they're doing a big lunge, I can basically hit them in the head and get out. Uh, but depending on your range difference, aiming for the arm is also pretty good with the hand as you kind of run it away and stuff. So again, I'm doing a retreat, retreat, and advance, retreat, retreat, half advance. And I can go right into my reverse lunge if I think they're coming forward pretty hard. Or I can just go for a little bit of a hand snipe by going retreat, retreat, half advance extension, and then I retreat back. I got one more play. So this, now we're going to uh, utilize another feint here. And our, we're assuming our opponent, because they're impatient, they're not, less, they're not really going to go for the parry necessarily in this case. They're going to aim for uh, 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 try to counterattack into our feint. So again, when we feint, we're going to expect our opponent to either parry or to attack into it. <clears throat> With the impatient fighter, I would say it's a little bit safer to assume they're more likely to attack into it. But again, that's going to really depend uh, from fighter to fighter. And these are just fun little neat buckets for our experiments with. But I'm going to start this off by feinting to the inside line to draw my opponent to basically try to control my blade and attack at me. As I start to do this, I'm going to do a scanatura, which is a type of transport. So I feint on the inside. They start to try to do the attack on the inside. I'm going to get my tip up and over their weapon, drop my tip underneath. So now I got their weapon low on this outside and then bring my tip back up. 
So that's just the scan to our motion. Some people call it a circular parry. So I'm just basically crossing my tip over there, bringing it down, and then getting my point back up. I want to get the offhand in play too, but I'm showing off what the sword's doing. So from here, tip over. So I'm on the inside line. Tip over, down, and then get my point back up on here. So how this works with the uh, uh, impatient fighter is that maybe I've annoyed them at this point. So now I'm, I've gotten to the point of annoyance where now they're gonna be impatient. So I've thrown, uh, thrown this feint to get them to try and attack. I do my skirnature. I'm gonna do my skirnature while slipping my front leg back. And I'll get my off hand here as an extra support. So the idea is again, if I think my opponent's gonna come at me hard, I'm gonna probably do the skirnature while starting to run away in case it doesn't work. I can now at least keep getting running back or going offline much easier instead of if I was very planted. Usually when we do the scanatura, it's very, we do a passing step forward. Uh, but in this case, we're gonna do it while taking a little bit of a step back to kind of give us a little bit of extra time. Uh, and also just in case something goes wrong, we can kind of get out of it a little bit more. So again, I'm fainting to the inside line, doing my scanatura, we'll slip on my leg back getting my off hand here. If I have a dagger, that's even great because I get this nice big wall. But I get my off hand here to help control the weapon. Hopefully they run into it and I can recover and control their weapon. So faint, signature, strike, and then recover on whatever line you need to. Nice. Yeah, when I, and when I get, when I use my offhand, I try to get it as close on this particular one. I try to get it as close to uh, my, uh, my off, my sword hand as I can. So if I do it here towards the, if I put my sword down, if I did my skinature, I'm getting my, basically put in my like forearm or wrist, like right on my arm. So there's no gap. Cause if I'm here and I have a gap, my opponent could slip in between and strike me. But if I get here, now they got to go over my hand. That's a much bigger motion that I can easily follow them with. Nice. Skin tour is a lot of fun. It's also one of my favorite actions to do against opponents and stuff. Uh, some people will just kind of like watch as you kind of do that blade action against them which is kind of nice. Uh, they kind of become spectators in their own demise. Um, but it can be a little bit tricky. Uh, some of the keys with it is you really make sure that you're, uh, you're clearing the blade past your body. So usually when I'm doing it, I want to make sure that my body is pulled back a little bit. I don't want to, this is more important if, you, if I'm going forward because I'm doing this while withdrawing my body, I'm not super worried about running my, the point onto my blade, uh, sorry, my body. But if I'm doing this as a forward action, I want to make sure that I'm doing it with a hip hinge until I get it cleared and then I can step forward. Uh, but because we're doing this in reverse, I'm already withdrawing my body, so I don't need to worry about that hip hinge as much. But I just want to kind of keep in mind if you ever do it forward. <laughs> no problem. This is a fun one. All right, so we ran like 20 minutes later than I was expecting. Sorry about that. I hope this was useful anyway. This is the first time I've taught this as a actual like hands-on kind of do class. I did this as a lecture uh, back in the springtime. Uh, I'm hoping to do, turn this into our in-person class. So uh, thanks for everyone basically being uh, my guinea pigs and kind of working it out and stuff so I can kind of uh, refine everything. Uh, let's see, let me just grab some links for you all. So I'm gonna drop in the links to the slides and also some of my social media accounts in case you wanna get in touch with me later or if you wanna review the slides and such. Uh, I am going, I was in recording the video, so I'm going to upload this to my YouTube. So if you want to watch it again later, um, you can do that. If you ever want to reach out to me, uh, please do. Yeah, I could do a, turn, do a whole month is beyond the basics. So yeah, I, I teach two other uh, uh, classes uh, regularly during the week. Mondays is my Beyond the Basics of Italian Rapier, where we have a monthly theme that we basically uh, uh, go over. This month is Voids. So if you like, if you really like voids, uh, seek me out on social media. I can give you the link to that. Uh, every Monday from seven to eight this month, we'll be going over voids. 
And then on Thursdays, it's back to basics. Um, it's at a new time, also from seven to eight. Uh, it's a monthly theme. The first half hour, we work on some core principle of single rapier. Uh, this year, I'm oh, sorry, this month, it's going to be measure. So the different measures that we, in the different plays we can do. And then the second half is a strength and conditioning workout. Um, it is scalable for all fitness levels and experience levels. So if you're like, I'm not very athletic, by all means, you can get through this routine. I built it so like uh, you work as hard as you can um, and you take breaks as much as you can and stuff like that. Uh, if you, I can send, if you're like, I'm kind of interested, but I'm not so sure, get in touch with me and I can send you a video and you can kind of watch it. And we can also talk about it and stuff like that. Um, but also that's another fun class in case you're looking for, uh, if you need an excuse to work out and also do some fencing stuff all in one go, uh, that's been a really fun class. Um, so that's it. Uh, that's it for me. If there's any questions, um, you can put in the chat or you can turn your mics on. I think there's nothing on my Facebook. Yep. Cool. Well, I'm going to stop recording, but I'll, I'll hang out for a couple of minutes anyways, in case anyone wants to uh, ask questions basically off screen. Thanks, everybody. Hey, Remy, this is Shazada, um, aka Eve Leapfried. I just wanted to say thank you so much for working with Virtual Pensick. Um, I think this was absolutely fantastic. Um, I was kind of multitasking, doing some stuff in the background at the same time, but I think that you did a fantastic job and thank you again so much for your time and doing this for us. Thanks for having me. This was fun. It's nice to kind of, a whole bunch of new faces. Uh, some people from my radio, <laughs> the new faces. Yeah, I'm I. I saw some mid realmers joining in and um, a couple of people from my own barony. So very happy to see you guys joining in and participating. Yay.